it's an honor for me to uh, welcome our next speaker, Mr. Alison Santos, please. Hi, hi everyone. It's so good to see many of you who I know online and I hope to one day be able to meet in person. Yuta, Batia, Paul, Dida, so many of you. Nino, thank you very much for inviting me to be here with all these great people and uh, for organizing this event. And uh, I'm very, very happy to be here with you. Well, I will try to share with you one of the things that I've been studying for the last years, uh, which is the psychology of love. And in a, in a more uh, deeper way, I want to share with you some of the uh, quotes that we can extract from Victor, from Victor Frankl's uh, work. And then I'll try to uh, pass to you, share with you the reflections that I have been doing with myself and also here in our institute in Brazil. Well, I will share the, the screen. The psychology of love is something that I'm interested in talking about for many years. I remember in 1997, when I was a student in the psychology uh, course, uh, during one presentation from a psychologist, a professor, one of my colleagues uh, raised the hand because this psychologist was talking to us in, in our first year uh, about how the how we should use the techniques, how does it work to be a clinical psychologist? And after her speech, my colleague asked her, well, what about love? Where does love uh, stay in the relationship in the clinical work? And this uh, professor, very fast, very quick, she answered, well, there is no love. Uh, this is a technical and a professional relationship the client hires you and you, you offer your work and that's the relationship. And we were a little bit surprised with that question because as many of you know, uh, many of us go to uh, study psychology because we really want to help people. And sometimes in the beginning of our courses, uh, we, are, we are told that, well, you actually, deep in your mind, in your unconscious, you really don't want to help people. You want to help yourself because uh, we are all always thinking about ourselves first and all these kinds of things that you know very well. But throughout the years, I got to know uh, after uh, actually five years studying psychology, I got to know the studies, the work of Viktor Frankl. And then I said, well, here's a theory, here's, here is a work in psychology that I can understand better because it says about what I feel, what I think of uh, psychology and the relationship that we should have in psychology. So I'll share with you some, some things that uh, I, I have uh, done in, in this way. So this is the book, Heroes of Our Existence, that I wrote. I, now we are translating it into English. I'm sorry, we, I, I can share it with you now, but I hope after the review, uh, we can we will be able to do that. Uh, I, I have the pleasure to have my uh, some, somebody that I, I really admire who is reviewing the book, who is Jay Levinson from the United States. And I hope uh soon we will have it in Portuguese. And so here I, I put some uh, reflection about the concepts of love. So what, what is love? Uh, well, the Greeks will help us to understand at least three uh, concepts of love that would be, for example, the first one, agape, that means uh, the love of God and also the love for God. This is one of the, the, the meanings of, of agape. It's used in the scriptures. Uh, it, it also means uh, of the, the mouth wide open. For example, uh, when you are surprised or, one, or wonder, 
Uh, and this is very interesting. I think it has to do with when we feel love, right? When we see somebody who loves uh, actually uh, also. Uh, the other word is eros. And for the Greek, this is, uh, the Greek will tell us about the God of erotic love, uh, the sum of life's preserving instincts that are manifested in as impulses to gratify basic needs, as sublimated impulses, and as impulses to protect and preserve the body and mind compare death instincts. Uh, so this is the, the, the kind of love that is more related to our bio psycho, uh, uh, to the, well, and this is something that, for example, when talk when we talk about love in psychology, and there is a book called the Psychology of Love uh, from the United States, and it is all about the relationship among two people, people who are in love with themselves. And what I wanted to talk in my book and extracting from the work uh, of Victor Frankl is to talk in a wide way about love. And then we are talking more about philos, which is the next uh, concept that the Greek will offer us. That means friend as a noun, near and dear as an adjective. It is a term of endearment, an emotional term. It means virtuous and dispassionate love. It starts from a concept developed by Aristotle and includes loyalty to friends, family, and community, requiring virtue, equality, and familiarity. Well, so what does Viktor Frankl speak about love? There are a lot of quotes in Viktor Frankl's work, and in my book, I, I could gather many of them, and I'll, I'll share with you some of them. Love is the only way to apprehend another human being in the depths of one's personality. No one can be fully aware of the essence of another human being if one does not love this person. Through the act of love, one is able to see the essential traits and marks of the loved one. And even more, see also its potentials. What has not yet been revealed? What must be shown? Even more, through one's love, the person who loves enables the loved one to manifest one's potentialities by making the person aware of what one can be and what one can become. The person manages to make those potentials become reality. Well, each sentence, each paragraph, each word of Viktor Frankl about love is like an encyclical that we, we, we have to read and read again and try to understand and go to his life and see where does he take that from? Because it's not just theoretically. He lives these kind of things in him, in his history. And this is very interesting when we bring it to clinical psychology, because I believe that in clinical psychology, we can't not, we cannot just apply theories. We have to live what we believe and we have to put it in, into practice in what we do. So we are a try we can understand from Victor Franco's work that we are capable to love because the person is unique. So we can apprehend the person, the essence of the person through love. So if the work of the psychologist is to understand the person, is to help the person to find oneself to overcome the problems through one's potentialities. So we have to capture, to apprehend the essence of this person. So we are capable of self-transcendence. And love would be the most, uh, the, the highest capacity that we have to self-transcendence. We can capture the essence of others. Our love can bring out the best in others. 
how amazing that is. And once Viktor Frank will say to us, love is the quintessence of wisdom. So we are not just talking about theoretic theories that will, well, you have to love because love is going to be good for the others. No, what Victor Frank was saying, well, this is the quintessence of wisdom. Well, wait, if we want to be smart, if we want to be wise, love is the best way. Not just because this is some commandment or religious commandment. No, it's something that really, psychologically speaking, it really makes the best in us, the best of us. It's also a human phenomenon. And here is where Victor Frankl goes in a different way that most of other authors that will say that love is a, an epiphenomenon or this is a need. Well, if we uh, want to survive, we, we want to reproduce, then love comes as a consequence of our need to reproduce, of our need to, to survive. No, Victor Frankl, he doesn't say it's an epiphenomenon. Love is a human phenomenon in the exact sense of the word. It is especially human phenomenon that is to say it cannot be reduced without further ado to a subhuman phenomenon, nor can it be deduced from a subhuman phenomenon as an original phenomenon that as such it is impossible to reduce to something that strictly is behind it. Love is an act that characterizes human existence in what is human. In other words, an existential act. Even more, it is coexistential act par excellence. That's beautiful. And that's very self-explanatory. And, and there is a reason why Victor Franco says that. And it's also because we are capable of self-transcendence, not just capable of self-transcendence, but we realize ourselves, we fulfill ourselves as human beings when we can self-transcendence and when we can, of course, capture our essence and the essence of others. So the essence of human existence, I would say, this is Viktor Frankl, rooted in its self-transcendence. Being a man means, per se and always, addressing oneself to something or someone, giving oneself to a work to which one dedicates oneself, to a man one loves or to God one serves. If love is all of this, and a lot, a lot more, how can we bring it to psychotherapy? And I think this is a challenge for every one of us who is working or working with psychology today, especially today, when everything has to be measured and when everything has to be in statistics. And this is a challenge we, because we have to bring it to, uh, to, the academ to the academy. We have to bring it to the papers because we are talking about a, a special capacity for human beings. And actually, it's not just logotherapy that sees that. It's very, it's evident. Every one of us can feel touched when we are loved. And every one of us can feel better when we can love. And every one of us feels touched when we watch videos, scenes, movies, theater, when we listen to music, where there are things about real love. And we are also always touched uh, by it. So I'll share with you, and in my book, I can share it very uh, uh, with a lot of details. But there was a 56-year-old woman that I, uh, I was seeing. She was my patient. She had depression. It was very, uh, very deep, very serious depression. She was in her room in her bedroom, he never left the bedroom, or sometimes she just left the bedroom to go to the kitchen to eat, to go to the bath bathroom, and she never left her house, 
And then she started coming to see me because at that time there was no Zoom. There was no online therapy. So she had to come to my office. And once a week, she took uh, public transportation with sunglasses and went to my office and entered my room with sunglasses. Uh, and she never took out the sunglasses. And she was really bad. And what happened is that she had separated from her first husband because there was violence. There were a lot of things that wasn't good. And she had four children. And uh, but she didn't have money to to live without her husband, who was a very rich man. And the, as the time passes, he got courage and she decided to separate. Everybody was against her, especially because of the money. And her children who were adolescents at that time were very, very angry with her as well because also because of the money, also because of her, their dad. And what happens is that she entered in another relationship. I'm, I'm summarize uh, many of the details here. And uh, in, in this second relationship, uh, her previous husband died. Part of his fortune went to her and to her children. And the second marriage wasn't good as well. He decided to separate, to have a divorce. And this second husband entered in the justice to sue her because he wanted part of what she got from her previous husband. And of course, it wasn't uh, very fair. And uh, what, what the justice here in Brazil did was to freeze everything. So she didn't have any money. She didn't have anything because the justice froze all her assets, all her money while they were deciding what to do. And it, it took years. And she was depressed. So it seems to be, uh, it seemed to be uh, an exogenic depression. But more than that, it was also a neogenic depression because it was the attitude that she had in front in the face of these situations. Well, she came to therapy. There were a lot of uh, weeks, a lot of sessions and a lot of techniques that I was applying to her case. And once uh, I told her, well, you were still a mom, and she didn't talk to her children for a long time. You were still a mom. Why, why don't you go to see your children? Well, they don't want me. They don't look for me. They don't love me. They fought with me. They don't like me. And uh, I said, well, but you are still a mom. You are still their mother. Can you offer your help? Can you offer something to them? And after some uh, some talks, but it was in a specific session when I could help her to access this self-transcendence capacity, but not just self-transcendence, but the possibility for her to live that position of victim to help somebody else. And it was not just anybody else, it was their, her, her children. And in that week, he, she, be, she returned the next week and saying, well, you helped me a lot because I got the courage to, to call to my son and he said that he, need, he needs help. I called my, 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 my daughter. She said uh, she accepted me to visit, visit her and I went there and what happens is that she needs help with her children, my grandchildren that I have never seen before. I, I'm helping them now. So to summarize everything, it was really a change, a very big change in this case. And it happened, especially because she could access her capacity to love through self-transcendence or to self-transcendence through love. And well, many other cases in this sense, uh, just to say that we can bring it to our clinical practices. So uh, 
Also, Victor Frankl, where does he come from with, uh, where the, the idea of love comes from? Not just from what he thought about what was the best, about uh, what he learned with his family in uh, the education he received, but also in theory. And here is something that I like very much that he says about uh, Scheller, uh, Hattenberg, and Sprenger. Scheller defines love as a spiritual movement towards the highest value of the loved one, a spiritual act in which that value, what he calls man's salvation, is captured. Sprenger is not far from this. Love for this author recognizes the possibilities of value of being loved. That is what Hattenberg expresses. In other words, love sees men as God thought him. Well, can we be heroes? And I, I'm just going to my last part of the presentation. I know I'm taking too much time. I'm sorry for that. And so uh, how can we, we, we teach love about love? How can we, how can we tell people that, well, Loving is not some kind of duty you have to do as if it's very heavy or very sacrifice, a lot of sacrifice. It doesn't get a lot of sacrifice, or maybe it gets, but it's good for you. This is heroical. This is, it can be heroic. And Philip Zimbardo Maybe most of you know him. He's very famous for his book, uh, The Psychology of Evil. He, he says uh, he has some words about hero, uh, heroes. And he, he says hero, heroism is not just the privilege of those who perform extraordinary exploits or who, takes, who take risks to protect themselves and others. More than that, hero, heroism is a mentality of the accumulation of our personal and social habits. It is a way of being, a special way to see yourself. Being a hero presupposes to act deci decisively in the critical moments of life, to try to resolve injustices or to create po positive change in the world. Being a hero also requires great moral courage. Each of us has an inner hero waiting to be revealed. We are all developing heroes. Our training for heroism is life. The everyday circumstances that invite us to cultivate the following habits. Performing kindness, actions uh, daily, uh, showing compassion, starting with self-pity, revealing the best of others and ourselves. Covering love, even in relationships more challenging, and celebrate and exercise the power of our mental freedom. Well, I think here we can understand that hero heroism is very linked with our ability, our capacity to self transcendence. And it's also very linked to our capacity to love. And every one of us can love. When we love, we, we access this self-transcendence, which is very good, as we all know. And also, we can, we can feel better, and we can also overcome our... Uh, it can help us to overcome our mental uh, problems. Um, and this is the best thing for me to end. And I love this quote when Victor Frank in a, in a presentation in, in one university in, in North America. He says this, quoting good. Uh, he says, if you take man as he really is, you make him worse. But if we overestimate, if, if we overrate man, we promote him to what he really can be. And this is something that we have to think. This is something that we have to try to understand and try to put in practice in our clinical practices. In every work that we do, not just in clinic, but in education, in, in the organizations. 
This is the most apt maxim and motto for any psychotherapeutic activity. This is what Viktor Frankl says. And I, I think this really summarizes what he believes to be what our work can be. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking so long. And here is some of my contacts. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Alison, for your lovely presentation. It's a pure pleasure to have you today. And uh, let me comment with the words of Solomon that uh, came on my mind now. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Thank you very much. And any questions? Any comments? Mr. Timo is commenting that you are you really are the heart of logotherapy. I can hardly wait for the English translation of your book. Thank you so Anastasia much. Anastasia commenting, uh, thank you, dear Alison. Thank you for being here today and all the important words you shared with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, yes, Mrs. Dida. <laughs> yes, Alison, I'm really glad to see you. I enjoyed your presentation tremendously. I want to add to what has been said here uh, that you are really at the heart of logotherapy, but I want to add that you are also radiating that being of love <laughs> in the way you are, in the way you talk, in the way you transmit your message. And thank you for that. And I want to just uh, um, kind of wrap up your beginning with your end that you started by, say, by saying, by, by describing a certain professor that said uh, psychology has nothing to do with love or something like that. And then I was thinking the next level is that people say, well, psychologists or therapists only have professional love, so to speak, quote unquote. So for that particular hour of uh, therapy, they sit in the position of, I love my patient or client, <laughs> but then they go out of the room and they have all their reactions, et cetera, et cetera, defensive uh, behavior as people. And this is not what we uh, mean by logotherapist. You first have to really live it. And then when you ended with the heroism, I really, and you did say that everyone has a hero in himself, I really think that it relates to what is called the hero, the journey of the hero. <laughs> the journey of the hero is really, yeah, taking a whole journey from, from a position of your comfort zone and your ego towards a real spiritual development. It can take life, but you're going on a destiny, on a, on a divine path, and each one of us can give birth to the hero of himself. And that's the relation of the midwifery, the art of midwifery in logotherapy to yourself and to your clients. Thank you. Thank you, Dida.